I would get something to help me find my grandmother. Now, an ambitious project has been launched to solve the mystery of Titanic's anonymous victims. In an effort to reunite the lost with their living relatives, the final chapter of Titanic's tragic story is about to be written. In the dark hours before dawn, on April 15, 1912, the Titanic struck an iceberg on her maiden voyage and sank to the bottom of the ocean. Equipped with too few lifeboats, the disastrous end took the lives of more than 1,500 men, women, and children. A deadly mix of human folly and natural disaster, the events of that night left a legacy of grief that lingers to this day. But the events of the days just following the disaster told another tale of tragedy. April 16, 1912. Within 24 hours of the Titanic's demise, the White Star Line, owners of the doomed ship, scrambled to send a team of Canadian sailors to the sea. Their mission? To retrieve any bodies left floating in the icy waves. The recovery effort was launched from Halifax, Nova Scotia, the closest major port to where the Titanic went down. The crew of the cable ship Mackie Bennett loaded supplies for her grim mission. Tons of ice, more than a hundred wooden coffins, embalming supplies, and canvas by the yard. The volunteer crew was offered double wages for the dark days ahead. They left Halifax on April 17th and set a course 700 nautical miles southeast to the scene of the wreckage. Four days later, they awoke to a sight that many aboard the Mackie Bennett would never forget. The surface of the water was covered with floating bodies, heads above the waves and arms extended. They were given the appearance of life by the slight moving of the sea. The crew unloaded the boats and sent teams of men out to retrieve the frozen corpses, drift and floating upright in canvas life jackets. The job was overwhelming. The men had expected few bodies, yet every day they came across dozens of victims. Many of these sailors left moving accounts of their task. I can tell you, none of us like this job at all. But it is better to recover them and bury them properly than let them float about for weeks. Hauling in the soaked remains and saturated clothing over the side of the cutter is no light task. Fifty-one we have taken on board today. Started to pick up bodies at 6 a.m. and continued all day. We recovered 46 men, four women, and one baby. The fourth victim discovered floating in the waves was a small blonde child, a young boy adrift with no life jacket and no identification. The sailors were deeply touched by the discovery of this body, the only child they would find. They resolved to provide a headstone and a proper funeral should no one claim the child in Halifax. Three more boats joined the search, and together they recovered 328 bodies. The rest of the victims had disappeared along with the Titanic. The names of individuals identified at sea were sent by telegram to Halifax, and relatives were notified. But the grief-stricken families of almost 1,300 passengers never knew what became of their lost kin. Most assume they went down with the ship, but some are now convinced their relatives' bodies were among those recovered. One of them is Joan Allison. She believes her grandmother, Catherine Wallace, is buried in a Halifax.
Fairfax Cemetery. The real closure would be to have a proper stone with her name on it. Thirty-five-year-old Catherine Wallace was one of only 23 women hired for the Titanic's maiden voyage. As a third-class matron, it was Catherine's job to tend to the needs of the immigrant passengers. Like many of the crew, she hailed from Southampton, England. Catherine had signed on to the White Star Line after her husband drowned, leaving her a widow with four young children to support. With the sinking of the Titanic, those children became orphans. Catherine's oldest daughter, Melita, was only 12 years old. It was a terrible shock to my mother, and she never got over it. I heard her say she was 35 years old, and she was too young to have perished like that. And this is why I took up the search, because I wanted to do it for my mother. Seeking help, Joan turned to historian Alan Ruffman. Joan has, in a sense, continued the quest to answer the question of where is her grandmother buried. She's done a lot of work and has become convinced that one of these bodies may very well be her grandmother. The key to Joan's search lies in the public archives of Nova Scotia. Tucked away in a storage room is a collection of documents relating to the Titanic recovery effort of 1912. Ruffman has spent hundreds of hours here digging for clues. The archives contain photographs, letters, and the biggest lead of all, coroner's reports for all of the bodies found at sea. I see descriptions of people that jump out as almost something or someone that you'd know. And I think surely if these were handed out to the families back in Southampton or other families, people would have said, that sounds like our son, that sounds like our daughter. But those sorts of connections didn't seem to be made very often. Perhaps not in 1912, but decades later, Joan Allison has connected her grandmother to a description of body number 281. The woman that was unidentified was 30 years old, and she had light brown hair and blue eyes. And in my heart and with the rest of the family, we feel that that was my grandmother. But how to prove it? The expertise lies 600 miles away in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Scientists at Lakehead University's Paleo DNA Laboratory specialize in the retrieval of old or degraded DNA. Ruffman joined forces with biological anthropologist Ryan Parr, and the Titanic Identification Project was launched. It was really amazing to me that there are families that are still trying to identify some of the unidentified from the disaster. They're very willing to do whatever they can to bring some kind of closure because they're associated with the grief of, of their relatives that were directly involved. A plan is formed to open the grave of body number 281. The scientists will retrieve a bone sample from which they will attempt to extract DNA to compare with Joan Allison's. If they get a match, Joan can finally put her grandmother's name on a headstone. The nice thing about the science is that it's impartial. It's not emotional. So that's the means here of, of getting at the truth. Hopefully there will be an answer. Before they disinter body 281, Joan provides a blood sample to Parr's team so they can sequence her DNA. In the body, DNA is present in two forms. From both of our parents, we inherit nuclear DNA, the type most commonly used for identification. But the preferred DNA for the Titanic project is found in the cell's mitochondria. Passed down through the maternal line, mitochondrial DNA occurs in greater quantities than nuclear DNA and should be easier to detect. With a plan in place to help Joan Allison, Ruffman and Parr see an opportunity to try and identify other Titanic victims. Delving back into the archives, Ruffman looks for additional candidates and is drawn to the story of the only child recovered by the men of the Mackie Bennett. From the moment he was first brought ashore, body number four was thought by many to be that of Justa Leonard Paulson, 
the youngest son of Swedish passenger Alma Polson. The child's fair hair and fur collar support the theory. Though buried as the unknown child, some of the records even list body number four as baby Polson. And his monument is just a few feet away from Alma's grave in the Fairview Lawn Cemetery. But until now, there has never been a way to prove that they are in fact mother and son. DNA technology may finally provide the answer. I think being able to put a name on that stone would be an accomplishment, not only for the technique and the, and the use of DNA, but there would be very clearly a lot of people who would agree very positively with putting the name of a young two-year-old boy back on his stone.